In this lesson, I'm going to discuss some trends in acidity and basicity, and we'll work an equilibrium problem or two. This is not meant to be an introductory video on acidity and basicity. You might want to look for something else if you're looking for how to derive pKa. Uh, for this video, you need to have a working definition of what pKa means, and we're going to go over some general trends in organic compounds. Let's go ahead and get started. The first trend I want to explore is the acidity of this alcohol versus the acidity of this thiol. Let's look at the pKa values of these two compounds. So acidity is the tendency to lose a proton, so we're talking about losing these protons here. Notice the thiol is at least 5 pKa units below this alcohol. This is a more acidic compound, so we need to figure out why that is. Sulfur is just below oxygen on the periodic table, so these compounds are in the same group, but we're seeing a dramatic increase in acidity as we move down the periodic table. This has to mean that the conjugate base of this acid is more stabilized than the conjugate base of this one. That's why the compound's more likely to lose its proton. The trend that we're observing here is due to size. Sulfur is much larger than oxygen, so we have this negative charge smeared all over the surface of this large atom, and that's very stabilizing. Whereas with the alkoxide, the O-, the negative charge is very concentrated close to the oxygen atom. So since we can't spread out the negative charge, it is less stable. Therefore, this compound is less likely to lose its proton. This trend is general, and we can look at this again by comparing the acidity of acids derived from the halogens. Now, even though fluorine is the most electronegative element, and you'd think that'd be great for housing a negative charge, and it's not bad, its pKa is quite low. However, as we increase the atomic size, we can see a dramatic increase in acidity here as well with HI being the strongest acid derived from the halogens. Iodine is huge, and that negative charge can be spread out over a very large surface. Now let's compare the acidity of ethanol and acetic acid. Both of these contain two carbons and a hydroxyl group, but acetic acid has this other carbonyl here. The pKa of acetic acid in water is dramatically lower than the pKa of this alcohol. This difference is also associated with stabilization of the conjugate base, but this time the stabilization is due to resonance. When we draw the conjugate base of acetic acid, we can push electrons to spread the negative charge out over the two oxygen atoms. That arrow pushing looks like this, and the resulting resonance form has the negative charge on the other oxygen. Resonance stabilization of the conjugate base is a very powerful effect. We can see this dramatic increase in acidity for this carboxylic acid here versus this alcohol. And we see a pKa decrease of more than 10 here. Remember, this scale is logarithmic, so that is huge. Now let's compare the pKa values of a couple of carboxylic acids to examine another trend. Here, we're comparing acetic acid and trifluoroacetic acid. The pKa of trifluoroacetic acid is negative compared to this pKa value of around 5. So what's going on here? Well, in both of these compounds, we have the same resonance effect where we can draw resonance that looks like this for both of the conjugate bases of these compounds. However, trifluoroacetic acid has this extra effect where electrons are pulled through bonds, not through resonance, but this CF3 group is very strongly electron attracting owing to the electronegativity of the three fluorine atoms. They attract electrons toward themselves through the bonds, and this is called an inductive effect. Now notice here that our pKa difference was more than 10, and here the addition of the trifluoromethyl group decreases the pKa by about 5. This is a general trend. Typically, resonance will be a more powerful stabilizing effect than an inductive effect, and we can see that by comparing 
these two trends. Now let's look at how charge can influence pKa. Here we have the hydronium ion, made by the protonation of water in acid. This pKa value is negative 1.7. Let's compare this to the pKa of water. Recall that water can act as either an acid or a base. And when it acts as a base, we form the hydronium ion. Water itself can act as an acid and form hydroxide, losing this proton. And the pKa value for that deprotonation is 15.7. So loss of this proton off this charged species, giving oxygen back its lone pair, is very low. Then we're taking off just the hydrogen of an OH group, similar to here, and we see a similar pKa. And let's just look at the species that results from the deprotonation of water. This is the hydroxide ion. And this really doesn't have a pKa. If you imagine ripping off this proton, we'd end up with just oxygen with a negative 2 charge on it that is super high in energy. And so deprotonation of this is not going to happen in any practical organic reaction that we're running. But this is a strong base. And we need a way to evaluate basicity of compounds too. So we mentioned hydroxide is a strong base. Water can act as a base, and when it does, it forms the hydronium ion. Now, the hydronium ion does have one lone pair on oxygen, but this is not a basic species. In order to accept another proton, it would have to gain a plus two charge on this very small molecule, and that's really not going to happen. Now, say we want to compare the basicity of ammonia versus this anion formed by the deprotonation of ammonia. Often this has a counter ion, maybe a sodium, so this might be the compound sodium amid, and this is just the uh, negative part of that. What we can actually do is look at the conjugate acids of both of these compounds and compare their pKa's to glean information about the basicity. This compound is the corresponding conjugate acid of ammonia, and this is the conjugate acid of this deprotonated species. Now we can see that this pKa here is much lower. That means this is a more acidic compound than this is. So this is much more likely to lose its proton and form this. However, this compound isn't very likely to lose a proton at all. It has a really high pKa, so this proton is not very acidic. So once we make this compound, it's really unstable. It didn't want to lose that proton. So if we have a very high pKa, we know that compound, the compound resulting from its deprotonation, will be the much stronger base. Therefore, this compound is much more basic than ammonia. So we can generalize a bit and say that positively charged compounds will make better acids and negatively charged compounds, analogous compounds, will make better bases. Pyridine is another base commonly used in organic reactions. It uses a lone pair on this nitrogen to accept a proton, forming this conjugate acid. The conjugate acid, pyridinium, has a pKa of 3.4. So we can see that pyridine is less basic than ammonia or sodium amide. Now let's look at what happens when we substitute pyridine with a couple of different groups at the four position right here. Now remember, these compounds won't really have a pKa relating to protonation of this nitrogen. We need to look at the conjugate acids. So the pKa of this conjugate acid is 1.6 much, much lower than this conjugate acid here. And the pKa of the conjugate acid, the protonated version of this, is 6.0. What that's telling us is this compound is not as good of a base. The conjugate acid has a low pKa, so it's much more likely to exist in this form with the proton gone. This compound is a much better base. We've got this higher pKa, meaning that it's much more likely to accept a proton. It doesn't want to lose the proton on the pyridinium as much as this nitro compound. 
To examine this trend, I find it useful to look at the conjugate acid and see if there's any stabilization. So now that I've shown this conjugate acid, I want to know how the sulfur is influencing this wanting to be protonated so much more than the nitro compound here. So I look to this and see if I see any of these effects. And there's actually a resonance effect here. We can take a lone pair on sulfur and push through this ring until we are able to neutralize the positive charge on nitrogen by giving it electrons back. Let's look at what the resonance form looks like. So this sulfur group is electron donating. We see that we can push electrons through the system and neutralize the charge on this conjugate acid here. That means that the charge is more stabilized once this becomes protonated, and that makes it a better base. So why can't the nitro stabilize in the same way? Well, the nitro has a formal positive charge on this nitrogen. There are no electrons that it can use to stabilize a positive charge forming over here. In fact, this is a powerful electron withdrawing group. So this wants to pull electron density away from the ring, away from this nitrogen, making its lone pairs less available to act as a base. And so that's the contrasting effect that we're seeing here. I just want to point out that there's two ways to look at this. I always like to draw the conjugate acid and then see if I can draw resonance stabilization. However, you could actually draw resonance using this molecule here, and both of these ways are equal. You could do it your way if you, if you find this is better. But if we draw resonance with the sulfur, we can draw a resonance form of this with a negative charge on nitrogen. If we can put a negative charge on nitrogen, well, it's way more likely to act as a base. So you can draw the conjugate acid and look for resonance, or you can look for resonance in your original compound if that makes more sense to you. Okay, now that we know a little bit about acids and bases, we need to know if we're choosing a good acid or base to actually do a reaction. And to figure this out, we'll need to look at equilibrium. We know from our discussion that pyridine is a base and that ethanol is an acid. So if we go into the lab and we treat ethanol with pyridine, Will that be strong enough to deprotonate it? We need a way to figure this out. And fortunately, we can use pKa values to figure out the direction of the equilibrium and estimate how far the equilibrium lies in that direction. What we first need to do is draw the conjugates of these. So imagine ethanol is deprotonated by pyridine. We'll draw the conjugate acid of this and the conjugate base of this compound. Now, remember, we don't have a pKa for this, and this has a negative charge, so we really don't have a pKa for this. But we can compare the pKa's of these acids. So this conjugate acid has a pKa of 3.4, and this conjugate acid has a pKa of 15.9. This species is more acidic, so it is much more likely to give up a proton by quite a lot. Remember, this is logarithmic, so we're looking at a difference of 12-ish. <laughs> so that's powers of 10 we're talking here. So the equilibrium really lies very far in this direction. This compound is much more likely to give up a proton to ethanol. And so these are the species that predominate in solution by quite a lot. So here, our equilibrium lies very far toward our reactants. Let's look at one more example. So here we're asking the question, is NaOH a good base to deprotonate my thiol? Let's draw the conjugate acid of NaOH and the conjugate base of our thiol. So here's one acid and here's the other. Let's add in our pKa values. This pKa is about 10 in water and this is 15.7. So we can see our thiol is much more likely to give up a proton being the stronger acid in our equilibrium. We have a pKa difference of about six. So that translates to the equilibrium lying quite far in this direction.
So NaOH is a great base to deprotonate our thiol, and we might want to use that deprotonated thiol in um, an SN2 reaction or something like that. KP here. If you learned something, give me a thumbs up on the way out, and for more chemistry, subscribe to my channel.